All right, guys, we're back here with the Soren X Be Legendary podcast, sitting here with Richard Soren and Bert Soren. This is Pop's Corner. We're going to be talking about a arms race, and that's a terrible pun. But we've talked about the base camp rack. We've talked about the evolution of a lot of things. And one item that stands out to me is something that I would have never imagined a use for. I've just found out has been in use for almost five decades in some shape or form. We're talking about the jammer arms. Uh, they're an attachment. Started out as a fixed position. We've just uh, started releasing the, the adjustable racks, and now we've just got the J-squat. So this has become literally an extension, but also diversifying the extension of the Sornex rack. So tell us a little bit about the history of this. When did this all start? When was the, the idea created? I think people really haven't changed that much to their physical needs or even their emotional drives. When I was young, and we're talking about anywhere from 10 years to, to 13, my formative years, I uh, had two parents that worked very hard, and I was basically left to raise myself. Um, weightlifting became an important thing to me, but also I knew enough the, the things I would try to do that sometimes you could get stuck Sometimes you needed a spotter when you didn't have one. And I remember what I call training behind the fence where I had a platform built in the backyard, which my dad sacrificed the entire backyard to do. <laughs> and over the fence that was right up against the railroad track, 72 trains a day came by, uh, I had a squat rack of sorts that looked almost like a step squat rack. And I found out that a lot of the movements I wanted to do that if I got stuck, I was stuck. Even with the safety bar coming out that I had built in, it was all wood. So I think back and nailed together out of two by fours and tied instead of a bearing because I didn't have that. I had two support arms that I could load weights on and, and be able to do presses and pulls and things like that. And if I missed, it would just come to rest on a crossbar I had. So I say, so I was doing something to save myself and to help myself train. So this was when probably I was no later than 12 years old. I'm 68 now. So the, the concept is not new, but made out of wood and rope wasn't exactly state of the art. I couldn't even make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich at 12 years old. <laughs> Like I'm, I'm having a hard time imagining <laughs> yeah. this being conceptualized. It, it's you never look at something f for what it is, or I don't. Uh, you look at it for what it could be. That's a, that appears to be a, a glass of water, but it could be anything. It could be a sound generator. It could be a sound resonator. It it could be so many things other than what we perceive it to be. So being in, a, in a, a world that was defined by my boundaries, don't go out of the yard, and I slipped over the fence, but don't go out of the yard's gravity, I came up with a lot of things that to this day are why we are here. Do you think it's uh, the, create, the creativity, imagination of a child that you never lost, or do you just think it was fundamentally that you are a tinkerer from the start? Both. 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 It, I, I feel it was maybe perhaps a gift that I never realized or understood, but it was such a strong drive to make something better when how it was was good enough for everyone else. But it wasn't good enough for me. Uh, even if I couldn't make it professionally better, I could rig it where what I perceived it to be was better so you said you had a, a really encouraging father you know he yes. facilitated a lot of this growth and learning yeah did did anyone else like at your school did you have any vocational teachers that encouraged this or is it just something growing uh, at home shop class was a thing back in the day and there were some very fine people involved with that most of the guy uh, the kids took it as a joke I was dead. When I went in there, I was in my heaven. I could make things that I thought about all week. I had good teachers that would go the extra mile to, to allow me to do something a little out of the box. Uh, they saw that I really 
wanted it. I wanted to do things, not just be in that class and leave. So do you feel like, you know, you have this in your backyard or across the fence and obviously you used it with some success or a lot of success. Did it get shelled for a while or was there a time period where you, you couldn't imagine using it on the rack? How did it come from two by fours nailed together to the original version to what we see now as an adjustable version? Well, me being alone, it was shelved because it worked for me, but I had no one to really show or talk to about it. I didn't have a formal gym where I could say, hey, guys, let's build this. So the idea stuck with me, just like uh, I mentioned yesterday, the the ox bar, the the bent in the center that clears your uh, cervical spine bar was a bar that I used in 1967. That's a long time ago. Now, I didn't understand the mechanics behind that precise angle and why the ends had to be a certain uh, angle from the floor, but I knew it worked. And I, I never, I hate waste, so I never would throw away that bent bar. I, I couldn't clean with it, I couldn't deadlift with it, I couldn't bench press with it, but I kept it long enough that I could repurpose it into something that was really meaningful to not only me, but all our, our training people that were with the Cedar Street Boys. So yes, yeah, sometimes you have to shelve that emotion to when you could bring it out. Again, the timing, like stepping on a bus. You don't step out too soon or too late or you miss the bus. It's, it's having that feeling in your heart that this what, what you are doing is right and it will help others and you include it. Right. So what is the what is the question that you answered with this jammer arm? Did you find that you were talking to coaches that were I mean, one thing that I can infer myself is the great learning curve of the clean. You know, you get the power clean at the football level or at the at football programs at the collegiate level. A lot of these kids are just getting by on their pure athleticism and now they're in a structured system. Was it answering that, that call of safety? I think it was answering the call of safety, but as I think back I really think that our training should be fairly, very sports specific, but to have a football player doing something that you would think would generate, let's say, power, to take three of the years you have him in high school to teach him a proper power clean might not be the best plan. Uh, I just did research and found out less than a week ago uh, an exercise I've been doing for years that I knew worked but I didn't know why had the highest uh, output of explosive energy of any movement and I go that's why that worked and it was it was taken out the danger it was taken out the excess movement the the uh, the possibility of hurting a wrist or turning an ankle if you take that away and you don't make it another skill that the that the football player or wrestler has to learn. Make it work, make it somewhat difficult work, but classify it. It's not another whole thing to learn to be a proficient weightlifter before you could play football. Take the parts of things. My training, and, and we were talking about Kaz as well earlier, his training and regimen was part of powerlifting, part of bodybuilding, all mixed together. That's why he was such a successful strength athlete. So using these and, and getting a coach to buy in on this, I know that you know in the, in the discussions that I've had with a lot of these collegiate strength coaches, just trying to convince them to do the deadlift. Oh, that's, that's unsafe. That's unsafe. So when you're introducing something like this to a coach who might be a dyed-in-the-wool Olympic lifter or Olympic coach, how do you convert them? I mean, is it just the, the simple fact of like, once you see it, you get it? Or do you have to then go back and say, look, we've done this much research with it. We've had this many people train on it. Is it how does that operate? I, th- I think first you, you need, out of respect, to give credit where credit is due. Uh, I was an Olympic weightlifter. I loved it. I was a power lifter. I loved it. I didn't realize that those two things really affected my sport, which carried me through college, I never put it together. I, I, I was young, and no one told me that if you do this, you're going to throw further. 
it seemed like the stronger my legs became and the stronger my back came from explosive movement, movements, the better I threw. So it was kind of like a feeling I had, but it was not a hard, fast rule. If I was going to tell you to go to hell, being the guy you are, I would be careful how I told you. Just say it on my left side and I, below I, the I knee. Would, I would <laughs> say, that's what I, I would. I would figure out what would be the best way to get that point across to you. Right. You're a big, strong guy who's dangerous and scary looking, so I'm going to put it in a way where it disarms you enough to listen to reason. I think that's a. I think that's a really good point in that. And I'm going off track just a little bit, but I think in 2018, the, the landfill that, or the minefield that we walk through is we're not always talking to find understanding. We're talking to be right or wrong. And that's where I could see the, the pushback being, oh, this isn't the way that I've done it. This isn't the way that I've had success. But you're a guy who has seen and, and been around strength for your entire life. I mean, at the highest levels, at the most obscure events. So I think that your voice would carry more weight in that regard, but I would still imagine you would have serious doubts. There's that, that, that moment of being a little bit afraid. And let's say if you looked at, let's say, a lie. If a lie is told as a white lie, is it okay? Or is any lie not good? If you tell a lie to help someone not do something terrible to themselves does that make it right or wrong there's a fine line there's a gray place in there that we all work you know i i do so respect olympic weightlifting i love it i follow it but i realize it has its place and it's not the end all be all right. like i at one time i did think uh, olympic weightlifting solved everything but it doesn't. It, it's, it's, if you're smart enough to take flour and eggs and sugar and salt and mix it together in the right way and make a great biscuit, everyone wins. Right. That's a pretty interesting way to put that. So what year are we talking that this came back off the shelf? We started looking at it, started designing it. I mean, what many, was the process there? Many years gone. Uh, the original kind of when it came back is when we got the opportunity to work with uh, uh, Miami Hurricanes and just the thought of hurricane uh, if you close your eyes you you could visualize what it looks like swirling and moving and all these things flying around and the, the coaches there were were really on top of it and they wanted something that was not a single station but something that could work be used for upper body one day, lower body the next, and it involved mimicking the movements your body's uh, able to do. To train in just one motion all day long, you're opening yourself to, to possible injuries for sure. So about, I think it was 1991, was it? The Miami Hurricanes? Yes. Uh, the 2001. 2001. Uh, when they wanted to continue uh, and, and put in a room, I suggested the, the, what we named the Hurricane. And the Hurricane had jammer arms on it, but it was not a single purpose unit, which I, I really it was- really was, a derivative of a double landmine. A double landmine, yes it was. So it, 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 was, it was trying to get away from the single use station to have a multi-use kind of thing. And once the Hurricane came out, a, a lot of schools got with that they would put it right behind their power rack and with those two pieces you could do an entire workout and not leave the area right but still i thought there was better things ahead so now it's starting to creep in if we have a thing called a base camp rack and it does accept all kinds of attachments and that is a strong exoskeleton why not tie something to it Perhaps Bert could comment on it because that is when Bert and his expertise started really moving us in the way that we are today. Yeah, thanks. That was probably, I would say, 2000, uh, between seven, eight, nine, somewhere right around there. And the base camp rack, is, as the, the hole started configuring, we were able to obviously lock more and more things to the rack. And the idea was to take 
the things we learned from the hurricane and the landmine and uh, be able to produce force in different gen- in different angles. So generally, if you're gonna if you're gonna bench press, the the force is always going vertically, although it's a ho- horizontal press. Still, the force uh, the the weight is going vertically because of gravity. Um, by creating a pivot point, you can start changing the angle of attack or the angle of the of the force production, and now you can start doing a bench press or a a jammer or whatever you may want to call it from a from a ground uh, you know feet on the ground position transferring uh energy from the floor through the hips out into the uh, upper body this just so happened to be at the exact same time that i was getting into the highland games so um my training went from olympic style hammer throwing into the highland games so now i was doing a lot more pushing movements some uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the old Werner Gunther video uh, where there's a 20 pound shot hanging. He's he's throwing oh, yeah. and pushing it, and and we kind of wanted to play with that. So I remember hanging. Gosh, this was 10 at least over 10 years ago. Hanging a, a shot put from uh, a rack, a bridge, one of the base camp bridges. Yeah. One of, another Sornex deal. Uh, we were hanging um, canvas bags filled up with plates and uh, medicine balls and throwing them. Uh, hung an anvil one time, which was interesting um (laughs) so uh, then then the jammer arm just kind of started okay well we have these uprights with holes in them what if we have these other uprights that pivot on uprights and then obviously you know the idea was from a pressing standpoint um and then the more we played with it the more it came up with the cuban snatches and some different row variations and uh some different transverse plane exercises and and so everything was kind of cracking right along and and we thought it was really cool. A few co- a few coaches were getting them, um, not fully grasping onto the the premise because they they saw that and okay okay we're going to do a jammer movement. That's all we're going to do. Um, and I'll be honest, it was uh, one of our guys, Aaron Osmus, that came on that really he got his pair and with his uh, uh, he got a pair of jammers on his base camp rack and with his expertise, sixteen years Division One strength coach. And he started playing with them a lot. He called me and goes, dude, why doesn't every school have these jammer arms? I said, that they should. But right. he goes, well, and so he started hammering out videos just where people saw what they were. And he was doing different uh, sprinting uh, mechanics drills and, and doing overhead step-ups and all these things. And people said, wow, these are really great. One of the downsides of the jammer arm has a lot of been the, the, the single-mounted uh, position for the pivot point. We've mounted it a couple different areas, but – the movement of it wasn't wasn't easy so when we came out with the adjustable jammer arm that not only indexes but locks in for a tension uh so you don't get a lot of wiggling on the on the piece that was when a lot of other exercises opened up like some different ground-based pulls uh the j squat like we've talked about um but it's it's been it's been just it's kept Evolving like everything else, it, you get you get some pretty smart people, and I'll say that some of those are Sornex people, and most of them are our customer base, and they they come back to us and say, "Hey, I hooked up a, a band down from the triphasic uh, bar down to the jammer arm, and I was able to do a push pull combo." Awesome, <laughs> and that that's that goes back to that strength adventure. So, just so people that don't necessarily operate around Sornex or are unfamiliar with the people, the process, how many failed models were created <laughs> before we got one that was that was right? Generally, I hate to say it, generally we're pretty close soon. We don't have a lot of just complete failures, mm-hmm. but we have a lot of iterations. Right. Um, that That's someone, yeah, I have some old pictures we could, sh- I might post of some of the original strap shackles, some of the original uh, jammer arm brackets and things like that and a lot of times they were just what was the the fastest and easiest for us to test the concept right and it may be a piece of cardboard it might be a piece of wood it might be something that we could do really quickly literally in the gym you and not it, even you have get to get it to the, the point where it works <clears throat> yeah proof of concept then you get where it works better and better right right that's how usually we approach yeah it, it makes so, it in the gym and then you pound and bang on it and start finding the weak points so I'll say you're the connections kind of growth and development guy. I'll say that you're the the, the creator, the artist, as we talked about sure. last time. That's a double headed dragon, and it's oh, a, yeah. a pretty pretty powerful dragon. But for you on the business side, on securing dollars and cents month in month mm-hmm. out, 
saying we do have a hurricane that is in our lineup, and now we sure. have something that rivals one of our own products. Is there is there a fear point for you in saying, hey, let's just pump the brakes on this because we've, we've got this product, or is it always a commitment to saying we're going to put the best out of out there always regardless? The, always the best out there. Um, I think both of us are too much of creators and artists to – to not want to see that art come together. And mm-hmm. I think that's a lot of what it is for both of us. We have an idea and it's almost down the torpedoes, even if it's going to sink our own ship. Unfortunately, you know, I've never said I was a great business, you know, stri- strategery person <laughs> to, <laughs> yeah. to, 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 uh, to quote dub. Um, <laughs> but yeah, sometimes you just got to get it out. And if you believe it's the better, solution you you run with it because is that a, is that a book coming out next year business strategy with business Bert? strategy <laughs> exactly <laughs> so i understand you know looking at the looking at the base camp rack and looking at the the jammer arms why then or when was the question asked and i and i like to ask this question a lot it needs to move it, it needs to move differently than it's moving now right i i'd have a hard time thinking back I mean, gosh, probably 2008, 2010, somewhere in there. So it was like, we've got it right, and then it's, oh, we've got to do something different. Yeah, we knew that something needed to change. I have an old picture I'm trying to find of, of, I I remember it was between 8 and 10 of doing a belt squat, a a jammer type, a J's type squat off of a jammer arm, but it was just bolted low. And my thought was, well, no one's going to want to bolt it back and forth, so if we could come up with a really good way to adjust it, we will. But we're not going to come up with a half-assed way to do it. I noticed uh, when we were working on the rack, like you talked about the stability. That's one of the things that I constantly get complimented on my rack. You know, you go to these racks at a lot of commercial gyms and you hear this, right. you hear the, the rack swaying back and forth. I've used the jammer arms. I've used the adjustable jammer arms and obviously used my rack consistently. You don't get a lot of that. So what are we doing different in that regard? Or is that inside <laughs> secrets? We can't, we can't tell, but... In an ideal world, if you go back to geometric shapes, a rectangle, which is basically what a power rack looks like, is not inherently strong as it's from side to side. It wants to, by by design nature, shift back and forth. Now, a vertical downward load, it will support a tremendous amount. If racks... Um, not let cat, cats out of the bag, but if racks were a truncated cone, they would work way better in some ways, stability-wise, but you would lose some utility. Mm-hmm. So I have no idea up, what a truncated cone is, by the way. Well, I'm, just, I'm rolling with it. Let me Google that. <laughs> I'm <for> rolling. <laughs> That's why they built pyramids. If right. you took a pyramid and chopped the the point off right uh, extremely stable extremely strong but by gaining that stability so it doesn't wiggle a little bit and all racks do if you keep kept them straight up and down which how we build them it allows you to much easier access to the accessories to safety bars and pins things of that nature so in some pl- in some places, to gain something, right. you're going to lose a lot of other things. So so the the form does follow function. So the the ability for a rack, as I said before, a, a 50 ton load. So that's a hundred thousand. That means you could, in theory, load 400 thousand pounds vertically on a rack before it would fold. <laughs> Think about it. Yeah. Or, or each bolt that's a one-inch bolt is 191,000 PSI to pull it apart. Why do we use that? Because it fits the one-inch holes that allows you to use the entire rack for all your accessories. It's an overkill, yes, but it's a better way to do it as we see it. Why build a, a super heavy rack and bolt it together with Right, pencil thin bolts. Well, people thought we were crazy when we came. Yeah, out oh, they, bolts. yeah. Well, we're I, condemned for it. I'll be honest. I mean, and this is not singling anyone out because there are many. But when you go to these conferences and you see the competition racks, you know, as we've talked about before, 
from a distance, oh, that looks just like a rack is a rack is a rack. Mm -hmm. But then you start seeing the things like these pencil thin bolts versus our heavy industrial bolts and so on. I would be terrified to lift on some of those. Now, they serve a purpose for someone, and that's fine. Of course. But I think when you're talking about what we do, it's it's commanding that this will never yeah. fail. Yeah. It just it well, you ask the question, <clears throat> what's going to break first? Right. Right. And and you want to keep backing up, saying, okay, the bolts never, the wells never, or to make sure that it's always overbuilt instead of just enough. Right. We've never done that. We, we've probably exceeded by two times the strength that it needed to be to sell it. Right. Most people don't notice it, but I do. Bert right. does. Sure, sure. Our craftsmen do. So to us, the form, as I said, does follow function, and you want it as safe as it can be, but you – used in the way you want it to don't lose the ability of iraq doing many things by saying it's not going to move well if it moves a little bit it's not going to ever collapse right so speaking of overbuilt looking at the mechanism that adjusts those jammer arms yes sir that's a work of art in and of itself <laughs> yeah. i mean I, we we, de- we deconstructed that one sure. at, at a conference oh, yeah. you know when we were putting everything away i got to see the the insides and the outsides and how it all goes together did you did you come up with all that or is it I think I still have the original drawing that that I played with for a year and a half that is what 95% of what we're looking yeah. at out there. Yep. I still had the that what it had to do, how it would probably come about achieving that movement because the movement if if you had a jammer arm that was the whole length of the rack, the arc would be would change too much right so the ability to easily raise and lower that jammer arm is is very important but how are you going to do it where you you keep all the integrity possible keep it tight because you don't want it wiggle waggle all over the place you want to keep it tight and adjustable where it's user friendly as can be uh that's where the design comes from and then you say that ought to work and then we usually, uh, from old school, I always liked building something from an idea first to just to prove it's going to work. Right. And then go ahead and fine it down with the drawings and the AutoCADs and everything else. Other people, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong, they have artists that draw machines that they don't use nor does anyone else understand and say this is – the cheapest best way to build this thing to make money well that might be not be the best way for you to train sure so i rather see hands-on that this thing works the idea might be a raw sketch drawing we all get in together on it we all have our r&d people come up with a prototype or actually bert you know i've seen him out there roll the sleeves up many times Mm -hmm. and build that prototype till we feel that we have something viable that when it's cleaned up, it's a diamond. It's still a diamond, but it's a diamond in the rough. How closely do you currently work with, oversee, or discuss with the current developers out in the in the building rooms? We do better every day, I think. we Our communication is, is a main thing. Uh, Bert and I meet almost every day. We stay on the same page. We, ha- we put together all the minds that in the end will be part of that finished piece. Is it economically viable to buy those parts? Or is it just something you have to do a different way? Or does it take five times longer to weld it this way as opposed to do it on a laser slot system? Those are things that have to be decided, not by one. The concept need could come from one, but then with two of us together, how are you going to beat us? Right, absolutely. You know, so it's hard when there's that much behind it. Then we have some very talented people. Yeah, in, well, I, in, I think in the shop that have done it for. And, and I had a meeting, like I said, this morning, and and it was a concept. Played with it literally in the deer stand last night. Went went home, drew it up some more, thought about it all morning, drove in, called a meeting right away, and we're we're off to the races. Brought everyone in. Everyone looked at it, gave their two cents, and. 
and we're, we're going. But that, that's it, that's how we've always worked best. It's generally been fueled with passion, fueled with some speed. I don't. We don't like sitting on things too long, or they kind of lose their. And physical. it's not the end of the road, right? It's yeah. as best and as clear as we could see now. But that's not saying that we're not going to put more sure. into it if there's a way to make it better. Well, speaking we of, don't stop. Speaking of making better and putting more into it or attaching more to it, the J squat. Sure. I think um, I can speak very, very honestly about anything that I have shared. You know, a lot of times people will see our stuff and they'll they'll love it, they'll appreciate it. But this is one that really, really lit up my inbox. As soon mm-hmm. as I put it out, how much is it? Can it fit this rack? Can it do this? Can it do that? Can it do these things? And I think from a standpoint of financial evaluation for for the average person a sub $500 belt squat makes a lot of sense I'm looking at this rack I'm looking at my bank account why do I need to buy jammer arms and which let me me think about how to word this what am I going to be able to expect coming in the future not necessarily specific attachments but just there's more coming down the line. Sure. Well, the jammer arm is is in many ways a movable. It's just a movable extension of the base camp mentality. It's just multiple training solutions. So you you saw at first it was a bolt on handle, then it was a movable handle, then it was a movable bracket, and now it's a J squat. And there's more iterations of things that are coming down the pipe that are in the pipeline right now that are going to come with the with the. Uh, with a jammer arm so again it goes back to that that smartphone mentality that there's there's a few things now but there's more things coming and the people that believed in us enough to buy the first jammer arms right are going to be able to benefit from all the things that have come after yeah when they invested the first time they don't have to buy again they could they could add to it and make it better so does this replace the pit shark they're, they're different. Yeah. And they're different. I, I think the, the pit shark's a great piece. There's a lot of great belt squat solutions out there. Where the J squat really shines is the extremely small footprint, low cost. So the idea was how, especially for, for college coaches, people, and anyone, a home use person, they have a lot, lot less uh, money and space to take up. Uh, a college, instead of getting two or three dedicated belt squats, could have a belt squat on every single rack, and they could actually program. I've had I've had coaches tell me they bought twenty racks, and they said, "Well, from an accessory standpoint, if I can't get twenty, I don't want one." And right. that was the idea of we're all going to train, we're all going to, and, and what, taking one piece and making it a bottleneck kills the whole flow of the room. The carrying capacity of the room goes down. The efficiency, effectiveness, they don't want even want to deal with it. So. That's where I think it was the solution that gives a, a hip or a belt squat. It puts it into almost a, an army-like status where you could now hand them out to every every station that's in the room and actually program them. In the end result, Bert, that was that's kind of your baby, the J squat. Straight up heads the heads with a belt squat of any type. How close is it to e- equaling the the safety, the the travel, the the felt? Sure. Well, I'll go like a, a pros and cons. Um, I think not having a deck is a pro. I never like stepping up on the deck or tripping. Or if I was going to go super wide, super narrow, uh, or a telemark type stance. My foot, I'm pretty tall, so my foot was always falling off the deck. So I had just this just weird stuff. If I wanted to do a, a jump or if I wanted to do a step up, the deck was always a little bit cumbersome. So not having a deck is, in my opinion, huge. Um, the versatility of having more of them. But if, let's say, we go to one-to-one. Um, downside, you don't have handles currently to hold on to. Some people like to utilize that those handles on a pit shark or another belt squat so they could pull themselves up. Many people say it's for balance. I believe a lot of people just they cheat a little bit and pull sure. themselves out of the hole. It's fine, <clears throat> but call it for what it is. It's kind of like you doing a Hatfield squat versus a regular uh, safety bar squat. Um, because of the uh, the leverage arm being um, how we've adjusted it, it's and it's relatively long. You have a pretty vertical travel pattern 
with the uh, with the squat itself, so there's less shearing on on the knee. Is there the an ideal travel? You want to stay as close to that vertical as possible, and you're going to get a true vertical through a through a cable, and then that's where you start weighing it out. Is it worth having another weight stack? Is it worth having another set of guide rods, pulleys, everything to maintain the footprint that goes along with all of those things? Um, again, like you said before, everything in life is a balance. You 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 can't have it all. So, I believe that the the negatives uh, of a J squat are farly out or are, are greatly outshined by the positives of the low cost the uh the low footprint and the versatility and that's where i believe that it's a winner i'm very proud of it because it it, it just it solves a lot of the needs that i see that people don't even currently know that can be solved i was doing a little math in my head and, and of course a belt squat you can't change it readily into something else it's a belt squat that's and, the biggest thing and if you're done do it using your J squat, you still have your jammer arms to be yes. used in a totally different way. And doing some quick math, even you know what we, what we sell or we have sold that what was the standard belt squat, you're talking about the ability of having eight uh, uh, J squats for one belt squat. Price wise, yes. Price wise, you uh, from an economic standpoint. Sure. And a space standpoint, which yeah. is tremendous, it's it's all the things that go into a belt squat takes a lot of square footage to, for one little thing to happen. Right, and that's like you've always said it. Uh, you know, my dad really enjoys knives and collecting knives and stuff. And something he's always said, which was really interesting, he'll show me a knife and he'll say, "Okay, why is it so bulky? Why is it so heavy? Why does it have all this other stuff?" All you're trying to do is have a, a cutting surface. And a way to hold it. Well, that was it could be skeletonized. So what what is what are we trying to do with a belt squat? It needs to be a belt that goes around your waist and a way to load it, and a way in this case to take it off from a, a high a high mechanically advantageous position, so you don't have to squat all the way down. Right. It's nothing really more than that. Well, that was what I was going to say. Is you know from an we were talking about sports specificity and things like that. How much difference does a football player really need if he's utilizing a belt squat? You know, if we're talking about a couple of inches range of motion, if we're talking about the feel of the weight, we talked about what sixty percent is that what you kind of- is sixty percent of felt weight, i.e., if you have a thousand pounds of weight on the on the J squat, it feels like six hundred. Right. So, I think that sells itself. I mean, and, and not to make this a sales pitch, I mean, yeah. it's just it's information. It but I think if you're really looking at it. Can two people use them at the same time? If you had two jammer arms, they're really close. You'd have a little bit of trouble putting your plates on. I mean, oh, okay. you could yeah. have because the plate, the 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 storage pins are thirty six inches. So you you could do it. Would I want to every day? Jury's still out. Do on you that prefer one. Do you prefer the, the <clears throat> two sided or like a top loaded? Uh, the two sided is a better deal because you can load more plates on there and you don't get an inverted pendulum effect. Okay. Because that was a couple, I got that question more than a few times. We tried the top load a lot of times, and you just what happens? You run out of space on the stem because your plate is roughly eighteen inches. So right. now you've loaded up your four or five plates. Well, now you need more weight, so you have to put another pin behind it. Well, what do we right. do? We just reduce that that weight load against you even more. Now you're only lifting thirty or twenty percent of that next right. weight load, and now with two pins, you've pretty much maxed out your capacity, and you're still doing about three hundred pounds. So that's kind so, of the things we found. Last question. Sure. When is this available? Where can people get it? And <laughs> are there going to be multiple options? Yes. So the J Squat um, is currently available on the website right now for pre sale. That'll be, uh, we're doing a roughly almost 10% off during Squat Tober. Want to make sure people are getting their GPP work in there and squatting as much as possible. Uh, there are some other iterations coming that might be for the next uh, podcast, right. but uh, there's some other things that I think will again change the strength world. Second question or, or last question, an addendum, if you will, um, when you're talking about the jammer arms. Yep. As someone who travels around to a lot of gyms, uh, I understand budget concerns. I understand you know a small gym owner or even a home gym owner saying, okay. I just want the one jammer arm. Is that kind of cutting your nose off to spite your face in a way, or would it just be? Would you recommend somebody go ahead and buy the one, and then if that's all you could afford, buy the one. 
because you'll come back and buy the second one. Right. I'd prefer you save shipping and get both on the same time because you're going to buy the second one. Right. Um, the jammer arm, I would say, would be the number one landmine or jammer arm would be the number one accessory on a rack that I would suggest because of so many things you could do with it. Do, <clears throat> do our past customers, let's say the first brave soul that bought a jammer arm from us, either bolt on or movable, is that jammer arm that they bought still viable yes. for what we're coming up with? So that means they paid once, sure, and everything that comes out is is based. And there's to some fit micro that. tweaks that make it better and better and yeah. better, but it's still viable. It will still work. Yeah. So they're um, not out in the cold. They don't yeah. have to start over again. Absolutely not. It's still three inch tubing, two inch holes or inches on. Uh, on every two so their older ones can be refit older ones can be refit and i I guess thing i was thinking about the the something that maybe the the i use the jammers for the most or my pressing and that's i don't know if you're doing a lot with it but i've had i've had three different pec tears nothing major but i've had some tweaks and twinges and, and zippers and i found that generally when i'm bench pressing a lot because of my scapular or just because i have long monkey arms i put a lot of stress on there um so i've i've basically stopped regular benching because i just continue to get hurt but i found if i do my pressing with my the jammer arms depending on what i what's really cool i see a lot of college coaches do as well the further you walk into the arms you push them out the heavier and heavier they get because the 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 closer it gets to rise over from run right from the angle so the closer the further you walk out into the arms the heavier and heavier they load so let's say you have a 45 pound plate on each side well, my first set, I'll be almost near vertical, and it's a warm-up. My next set, I'll take a half step forward. It's a little heavier. Next step, a half step. And all I have to do is change my torso angle to match the level of attack, the, the angle of attack that I want. So I'm still doing bench press and incline press or a seated press or a shoulder press. I've just adjusted my, my torso angle, which makes it really good for me at home because I never have to change plates. Right. And a lot of these college coaches I'm watching, they go, oh, we'll just leave 45s on there, and it's good for everyone. Everyone just finds their zone. Right. So it's really safe. It's really fast. But the cool part about the safety is if you start missing the weight, you just back up. There's no way to get pinned. You can't, I mean, if you start feeling a tweak, you just, you back up a little, back off of it. And so you're never really stuck. And that's where I could actually max out on the jammer arms or go relatively heavy at home. And worst case scenario is I just back up. Function, form, safety. Safety, yeah. Yep. So it's just, it's just, I honestly didn't see that when we made them, like mm-hmm. as being such a big thing. And more and more, I just find myself do my do my upper body stuff on the jammers it's safe i could crank through it really quickly and i never actually take plates off call us here at sornex or <laughs> www.sornex.com get your jammer arms get the j squat we're ready for you let's do it